Hi, I'm Jessica Bayless, and I'm from the Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm currently on sabbatical at Unity Technologies, and I'm going to talk about developing games with data-oriented design. And specifically, I'm going to talk about what data-oriented design actually is. And the first thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about something called the Crooked Bridge. And it turns out that cognitively, we are biased in how we solve problems. And most people, when asked how you should fix this bridge, will say, add a block. And it's just as relevant to actually subtract a block on the other side. So additive strategies tend to be more prevalent and tend and it, they actually impact how things like software are developed and they can lead to things like feature bloat, right? And I wanna to talk today about data-oriented design, which tends to be a subtractive design process. And so why this talk? Well, the big thing is that most of the literature on data-oriented design is what's called gray literature. A lot of blogs, a lot of posts, a lot of YouTube videos, um, and one self-published book, which is actually a really good book, but there's not a lot of information about data-oriented design that's out there that explains it as a cohesive process. But there's a lot of people that are doing similar sorts of things. And so I've actually been studying DOD for a number of years, and I think it's actually a pretty cohesive design process, and I'd like to discuss that. And to know the fact that it involves data is not new in any way, shape, or form, and thinking about data is not new. There are lots of quotes out there about how important data structures are. Uh, data flow from the 1960s certainly had to consider data, although the goal of that type of programming was to consider how data flowed through algorithms in order to do parallelization. There are also you know, lots of things out there with data in their name, but they're a little bit different than data-oriented design for game development. And the history of DoD and game development, actually it was created in the mid-2000s when the PS3 came out. Multicore became very important for AAA games, and it was primarily used for those large-scale games. Around 2009, an article was published in Game Developer Magazine that basically talked about data-oriented design by name, and it involved all of the relevant things that tend to be talked about even today. And that leads me to what is data-oriented design? And it's actually a paradigm for solving problems in computing it's subtractive in nature because it tends to go back to the very simplest parts of how you can program on a computer, which means that a computer only inputs, transforms, and outputs data. That's all a computer does. And that makes it a subtractive design process. It also tends to be extremely data-centric because it's considering data primarily rather than algorithms or something else. It also is one of the only paradigms I've ever seen that has a very holistic view of the software development process itself that involves everything from the hardware to the tools. And I'd say it's almost like a supply chain view. So of course a supply chain is basically, if you look at something like wheat and obviously it gets cut and taken for processing, it then you know, gets turned into something else, which is a transformation. And then it gets driven and finally will get to the customer at some point. And if you think about it, that's really similar to how data gets transformed on a computer, except maybe the truck might be a bus. And so that leads me to DOD design principle number one. And that's that you have to understand the basics of the supply chain in order to understand how to engineer a software solution well. So how do you best input, transform, and output your data 
on a computer? You know, how does the hardware matter? How does the compiler matter? How do these things matter? And examples of this are pretty much any data oriented talk that you go and listen to will have something about this in it. And, you know, the examples here I'm giving, there's a really old one from 2009 um, from somebody from Naughty Dog that talks about uh, a mistake that Mike Acton made in a talk he did around the time uh, that, you know, something is not causing a load hit store, it does incur a pipeline flush, it takes around 27 cycles, branching on a floating point result is something that you should try to avoid. Uh, so on and so forth, you know, very, very hardware centric. Uh, he obviously knows a lot about the PS3, which is what he is talking about there. Uh, on the right, you see a talk by Mike Acton himself in 2014, talking about L2 cache and the amount of work that the compiler can optimize. And in the bottom, you actually see Andreas Fredrickson. And the important part about that is that he's talking about SIMD and you know, how it can be used for multi, for parallel processing. So that leads me to DOD principle number two, which is in order to do data-oriented design, you really have to know your data and you have to know all elements of the data. In fact, the first part of designing a program using data-oriented design is actually to sit down with a spreadsheet and say, what is my data? What are the elements of my data? And you talk about things like the range, the type, the frequency, the number of something. And as a very simple example, just say, I wanna add numbers. That's the problem I wanna solve. And it turns out there are a lot of different ways to solve this problem. And data-oriented design tells me that I should look at the data involved in this problem. So if I wanna add numbers, some of the things that I can look at are, you know, what kind of data is it? And what's the data type? Is it integer? Is it floating point? How many numbers are there in this thing? What's the range of these numbers? And how are the numbers stored? And you can probably think of other things to ask about the data. And it turns out that knowing about the data can greatly impact the solution that you have for this problem. And it should impact the solution for the problem. So for instance, adding 2000 coins of a particular value is very different from 1 million randomly distributed floating point numbers. In fact, if you just wanna add coins of a specific value, all you have to do is say, well, how many coins do I have? I have a counter. And then multiply it by the value of that particular coin type. So it just needs a multiplication, doesn't even need a loop. And of course that leads me to generic solutions, which tend to be a bad idea from the perspective of somebody that does data-oriented design. Uh, the reason is that it, they tend to solve problems poorly. So for instance, if I know what my data is, I can have a good solution in terms of software. And for instance, the loop is a very poor solution if I have you know, a bunch of number a certain number of a specific coin type. And of course, that doesn't mean you can't have flexibility in your solution, but you're supposed to design for that and design it to like, oh, this is going to change in this way. Sometimes when I take data into account, it feels kind of like cheating. You say, well, I know all of my numbers, they only go from zero to four. And so I can design my solution knowing that for instance, and it sometimes feels like you're cheating. However, it's better to design a solution for a particular data set uh, because it tends to involve less code, tends to be less confusing, and the less code you're involving, the less you have to debug and test, which is good. And again, we need to consider the problem and what needs to be flexible and that gets designed in. And of course, at that point, say, we all say, but the games are creative. I don't know the data in my game. And 
the of course you don't know all data in the world uh, proponents of data oriented design do a lot of testing and a lot of experimentation to figure out their data so one of the first things i learned when i started doing data oriented design is how to profile early in often so I can find things out. Frequency is one of the things that is especially difficult to get unless you actually can collect data and know how often something is changing and what the ranges are. Uh, so I would actually claim if you don't know anything about your data, then you probably don't know how to solve the problem. And with, there are places where things do need to be flexible which is why we have tools like level designers uh, for things that are gonna change a lot. And that leads me to frequency because it turns out that when you're developing a game in terms of when you develop different features of that game, frequency can actually be taken into account. So the higher the frequency of something, the more often it gets done in the game, the sooner maybe it should be developed. So you can ask, you know, well, what happens the most in a game? And a lot of times, especially for things like simulations, it turns out that character movement is one of the things that happens most commonly. Therefore, that should be developed really soon. And it should be very efficient because it can potentially take up a lot of cycles because it's happening all the time. And so you can actually consider frequency when deciding when to develop a feature. Okay, so current data-oriented design use, uh, there's actually a really canonical version of data-oriented design that's available. Uh, it's Unity's data-oriented tech stack. It's easy to download, easy to try out. There are lots of examples out there about it. And it really has three main parts that make it data oriented. Uh, first of all, it's got a design pattern called an entity component system. The entity component system basically considers this, you know, that data is only input transformed and output. So your input and output data are actually components and your systems are actually transformations. And then the entity is just a way to keep track of similar data with each other and run them together when they're transformed. Uh, so the burst compiler technology goes back to this kind of supply chain view that data-oriented designers tend to have. And so they, Unity's actually developed a compiler technology that help make games developed with data-oriented design run better, run faster. And of course, to encourage multi-core use and to make multi-core use easier, they have a job system. And, you know, again, that's all very core in, you know, how data-oriented design works. And so it's a good example of data-oriented design. So in conclusion, data-oriented design primarily subtracted because it goes back to the very basics of computing where the computer exists to input, transform, and output data. It's data-centric because you start designing with data-oriented design by considering the data first. And then it has a supply chain view, this very holistic view of software development that is going to include things like hardware and compilers and how they impact the data and its transformations. So in the future, turns out data-oriented design isn't just for game development, it can be used with other things too. In fact, in CppCon in 2018, there was a web browser tech talk that use data-oriented design. Also, when Unity started to develop DOTS, they also started internal training sessions. They've had external training sessions. And so I think education and knowledge of data-oriented design is only going to continue to grow. And what I'd really like to see more of is I'd like to see more study about this so that there's less gray literature 
and more things that have been peer reviewed and more consistent literature about data oriented design. So thank you very much. I look forward to the 20th and being able to talk about all of this in person. <laughs>